Okay, so you should see that pop up now. If it's behaving itself, lovely. Okay, fantastic. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming to, to this talk here today. And so I'm Alison. If you've been to the, some of the sessions before, you will already have, have heard from me. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Leadership Higher and Adult Education at the University of Toronto uh, right now. And myself and Erin, uh, uh, who is he? I think she's here. I'm sure I've seen her. Erin Anderson, who is an amazing doctoral student in the department. Uh, we're kind of uh, organizing the sessions. We've had some amaz amazing speakers and we do have a YouTube channel now. Yeah, we've been trying to get it for a while where we're putting some of the recordings. So some of the times aren't necessarily great for all of us being in different places. Um, and so if you have missed anything you really want to see, the recordings are going to be on our YouTube channel. And Barbara has very kindly agreed to let us put her session on YouTube, which is excellent. We're very, very happy about that. Okay. Um, so before we start, um, I'm just going to do a very quick land acknowledgement. Um, now, as you all know, we're, we're here in Toronto. So the department is out of the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Uh, and it's really important to us that we do this. So I, well, we wish to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Toronto operates. And so for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, this meeting place, it's still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And we think it's important to just acknowledge that. OK, so if it's OK with everyone, we're going to get started. So I'm going to hand over to Barbara Grant, the amazing Barbara Grant. Um, from the uh, University of Auckland. And she's gonna talk to us today about women as doctoral supervisors, which I'm very excited to hear about. So Barbara, whenever you're ready, I'm just gonna meet myself and myself and Erin are here if you need anything. And feel free to put things in the chat, everybody. Okay. Kia ora koutou. Um, thanks, Alison, for that welcome. And thanks very much for the invitation um, to come and talk in this series. Um, I have, I'm really delighted to be welcomed onto the land that um, Oise stands on and welcomed back into the, um, into the sphere of Oise, I guess. I have a strong affection for Oise, having visited there as a, um, several times over the years, more latterly um, through my connection with um, Professor Sandra Acker, who's here today as well. So lovely to see you um, here, Sandy, and lovely to see other people also um, in the audience who, who I know one way or another, and people who I don't too. So as you know, some of you will know, um, I've been researching in the space of supervision, the pedagogy of supervision and, uh, and academic work um, for quite a long time. And this, what I'm going to talk about today is, um, is connected to my most recent project, which is um, a so longitudinal study with a bunch of other academic women about our work as doctoral supervisors. And I'm in the middle at the moment now of writing a book based on that study. So this work that I'm giving today um, will be a chapter in the book. Um, and um, the actual, the, there's a sort of a longer version which is coming out in Lattice, the Bergan Journal, um, Learning and Teaching in the Social Sciences, um, shortly, within the next couple of weeks, I think it's due to come out. So. Um, I, the, this work is, you know, it will be published quite quite shortly. So I've called it Dismantling the Father's House and Women as Doctoral Supervisors. And just to put this work in the context of my of my bigger project, this really, I suppose, in a way, is kind of me, me looking at some of the history and looking at the literature. It's my literature review in a way, but I really at one point wanted to pause in my project and look and see what had already been written about by women um, about what it was like to be um, a doctoral supervisor. And so this presentation today is really based on my reading of that literature, which is not particularly large as it happens. Well, at least the Anglophone literature is not particularly large. But just to give you a quick preview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do a tiny little bit of history to kind of talk about the arrival of the modern PhD and women in relation to it. And then I'm going to turn to look at, at the literature. I don't give a table of the literature in this presentation, but it, that is in the article that's coming out shortly, which you, will, you can have access to. 
um, when it comes out. What, what we notice when we look back in the historical archive, and I wanted to just start by saying that, is that women kind of, women glimmer, women are mentioned very occasionally, way back in the archive of, um, universe, of Western universities. Um, and so here is an example of one of those women um, who glimmers, Dorothea Schlözer, who, um, as, as William Clark describes, is the first known examination of a woman for a doctoral degree. But the doctorate that um, Schlüsser was awarded was, and, and the reasons why she was given it and what she had to do to get it was very, very much not like um, the modern PhD. Nevertheless, I really want to make the point that women's presence uh, in, a, in, a, in the smallest way is, is, is there um, in the historical record of the, uni of the Western University. So let me just um, say that um, it's, it's worth noted, noting that the modern PhD is actually quite young. Well, 200 years, is that young? In the life of the university, it's, it's reasonably young, given that the university is over a thousand, the Western University, and I'm talking about, so if I can just have that as a shorthand, is, um, uh, over a th is, is about a thousand years old. So for the last 200 years, we've had something that looks like um, the, the modern PhD. The thing that made the modern PhD modern and distinctive, according to William Clark, was the written dissertation. Before that, the, the PhD process was very much an oral examination, and it typically was um, a candidate being examined in their reading of other people's work, not, not at all in terms of their presentation of their own work. The presentation of, their, of, of the candidate's um, own work, own thought, um, uh, came with the modern PhD. It spread pretty reasonably quickly um, from Germany where it started in the Clark says it started with the statute of the University of Berlin and then uh, in 1810 and within um, 50 years it has spread into the US, a bit later into Canada, but later again into Britain and into the um, Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand. So my position I'm located for those of you who don't know, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So that kind of, I keep bringing that back into my, my own frame of mind my um, and, and looking at that more closely than I've looked at other places. But nevertheless, it's kind of interesting to see what the, the trajectory of the arrival of the PhD. Competition was part of the deal. So the fact that universities are very competitive in the modern time is not an entirely new phenomenon. The reasons that were given to bring the um, PhD to the US and to Canada and to Britain was because of the brain drain of students from the America and Canada and Britain going off to Germany to do the PhD and then going off to the US to do the PhD and so on. And so that the, the, the degree itself was resisted in quite a few of these countries for quite a long time. In Australia and New Zealand, as you can see, it came with the expansion period of the universities in, after the Second World War. With the emergence of this written um, PhD, what we get is a shift in the relationship between the professor and the student. And so we now get, as Clark says, instead of the presiding professor who, whose work may have been the subject of the student's um, oral, oral um, inquisition for their PhD, and instead now that the student is writing their own work. And so what we get is a shift in the relationship between the professor and the student. In fact, this, what the shift is and what it meant for academic life is just about not written, in, in what I have found is hardly written about at all. But in practice, what we see is some kind of relationship between a doctoral advisor and a candidate. And in the German system, um, where it was um, originated, the research professor became the Dr. Vater, which is the, the Dr. Father. So there was a kind of um, an explicit, if you like, use of the term um, father to describe the nature of this relationship between the supervising professor and, and the candidate. Needless to say, supervision at this time was almost, it was pretty much exclusively man on man. Prior to this, medieval doctoral candidates had to be men. It's hard to understand how those women slipped through the net because there are so many um, prescriptions that say that Doctoral candidates had to be male, they had to be Christian, they had to be able-bodied, they had to be alive. There was a whole lot of interesting kind of um, caveats on how, what it meant to be a doctoral candidate, um, but definitely being a male was part of that. 
So the fact that some women slipped through that old system was interesting, but they certainly weren't students um, in the universities um, when the modern PhD um, was introduced. When people looked for what it meant to be a supervisor, um, apart from the Dr. Vata kind of image, which is the image of the parent, the father uh, as the supervisor, the other, um, the other kind of pre-existing educational structure that I think has, was influential, certainly in the British system, which is um, most influential for Aotearoa New Zealand, which is where I stand, the Oxbridge tutorial, I think, provided a template. So it's an old system of, of one on one education held in the privacy of the tutor's rooms and very much a kind of meeting described as um, being a meeting of the mind of the Paul Freeman says a good mind and a greater wisdom than his own. Um, and so there was a kind of there already was, if you like, a pedagogy which came out of that tutorial system that is very, when I read about that pedagogy, to me, it's very recognizable as the pedagogy of or as a possible pedagogy for doctoral supervision. It certainly wasn't how it was always practiced. In fact, it's often described as being practiced through neglect and indifference, but there was always a model for a more engaged and um, a lively pedagogy. And certainly that's how it was practiced by some people. In terms of the arrival of women into all of this, into this new um, educational degree, this new set of practices that were slowly came out of the emergence of, or the existence of this new degree, the arrival of women into this is actually, um, it's interesting because it, the history of the modern PhD coincides to some extent with the arrival of women um, into universities. And if I look, I'm not thinking now so much about Germany, but if I look at the Anglophone universities, we get the arrival of and we, we, the arrival of women into universities, patchily in different countries, actually, most quickly, if you like, in, a, in, in the colonies where this universities were desperate for students, and more slowly in some of the more established, uh, but in, in the US, which of course had colonial history, it was a very patchy kind of history of the arrival of women into the university. But what we do see is that very soon, apart from the US, very soon after the PhD gets set up on these universities, women start um, being awarded it. So the US is slow to start, but in Canada at the University of Toronto, for instance, where OISI sits, um, the first two women to be awarded a degree uh, got it in 1903. Well, the first PhD was awarded in 1900. So it was very quick that women were um, taking up this opportunity um, to get the degree. In Britain, the first women were awarded in 1921 and 22. Well, the first PhDs were awarded typically about 1918, 1919, 1920 anyway. So it was, um, as I say, the same kind of history. And again, in Australia and New Zealand, those, those degrees were um, uh, only began in the late 1940s and early and around about 1950, probably for New Zealand, and women were quick again began to take them up but obviously in small numbers however what we see is an interesting over time when we take the sort of hundred year look which is kind of where we're standing now um by the mid 1970s um 15 percent of phd awards were given annually to women in the us uk and australia according to Dai Leonard's figures but by 2010 the number of women being awarded phds overtook um, men and for instance in new zealand um, in 2020, 400 women completed doctorates compared to 290 men. That's looking at domestic students only, not internationals. So, and I think that's probably not uncommon that in many places now, it is more women than men who are being awarded the PhD. In the dark blue box on the slide, I also look at the number of women academics and what's happening there. Because of course, when I think about women supervisors, this is the people who I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the, the, um, the women who hold academic positions that are sufficiently stable and senior for them to be able to be doctoral supervisors. And we get this kind of pattern of slow, slow, slow and steady increase across the 20th century. But even in the 1990s, there are writers saying that there are not enough women who are senior enough or, or in established enough positions to be doctoral supervisors. Um, now in the 2020s, in terms of academic employment, um, the number of, of women academics um, is inching to parity in many countries, but you know, we, all, we know the pattern, they're still underrepresented in senior levels and in some disciplines, but I think it would be fair to say now that there are many, many women in most areas, uh, bar some uh, 
disciplines um, who are um, super, uh, doctoral supervisors, but that, that this is actually quite recent. This is quite a recent thing. Okay, so that's a very kind of potted history. And what I want to do now is turn to the, the literature and um, talk to you about what I saw when I looked at the literature. And this is going to be a very sort of over the surface um, look because um, some of it will be, I think, familiar to you, particularly any of you who are familiar with the literature on feminist pedagogy in, in universities. Um, and I really want to leave enough time so we can have some conversation. So there have been recurrent feminist critiques of traditional, of the traditional supervision, the doctor vata, the father, uh, the father son, if you like, model or the, the master disciple, guru disciple um, model of traditional supervision. Um, and so we have Frau describing it as normatively masculine back in 1988, and a few Australian scholars describing um, the model of hands-off supervision as neglectful or indifferent, and they use some historical accounts of people's experiences of supervision, and perhaps their own experiences as well, um, to um, underpin that. Um, and then we have Fran Kelly's work, where she does an interesting look at some fictional accounts of supervision to see how it's described, um, the, super, the doctor supervisor is described, or the master, sometimes it's the master supervisor actually, is described in fiction and, and finds some um, fairly stereotypical um, kind of masculine um, uh, uh, models for that supervision. And so what I did in my own project was I did a literature search to kind of to have a look more closely at the literature. So rather than, um, and to see what women doctoral supervisors were saying about their practice as supervisors uh, in relation to this kind of backdrop of this critique of traditional supervision. So what I did was I searched for Anglophone work addressing perspectives and or work of the woman doctoral supervisor. So I didn't pick up work that just mentioned gender or supervisors in passing. Um, so, uh, but I look, I wanted work that looked at what it was like, what the experience of it was like to work as a doctoral supervisor or to be supervised by someone who was a woman doctoral supervisor. And also to where people kind of reflected on that experience in a conscious kind of way. And in, in response to that search, I found a small body of literature, although every time I turn around, I do find something else. So this is a, uh, I have to say, this is um, a movable feast, but for now I found 26 works that kind of had this, this depth of engagement with this topic of what does it mean to be a woman doctoral supervisor? There are, you can see the spread across um, different countries. Um, they were a mixture of experience and observation-based and qualitative database. So some of them are personal accounts um, uh, based on, as I say, experience and observation, and some of them actually gather data from others and report that data. And what I brought to this literature was a couple of critical questions which are inspired by other feminist scholars. When I, when I, when I was looking at the literature, I had been reading um, the work of Isabel Stengers and, Vivi, and Vinciane Desprey, who, look at, um, who were looking at women philosophers, and their question was, what are women doing to philosophy as a discipline? What does it mean for the discipline to have women practicing as philosophers? And their answer to that is, is very interesting and very complicated. But so I, I, I modeled, I remodeled their question to ask what are women doing to supervision? And I remodeled another question, which came comes from um, Irigare's work around women in science. She says, is the women scientist really just a man? And so I sort of again adapted that question to look at the data and to ask this question, is the woman supervisor really just a man? I took these two questions because I was trying to get a kind of critical, a critical angle to look at this data from um, that might lead me to see some things that I wouldn't otherwise see. So when I asked the question of what are women doing to supervision? What I could see by reading the, the body of literature was that women write about themselves very self-consciously and explicitly as resisting and attempting to transform the meaning of supervision as a cultural practice. They might not use the word cultural practice, but and they may not use the word, that may not use the word resisting or transforming, but they would use some kind of word of that kind. And this is oh, this as literature spans, you know, the earliest literature I found was in the 80s, I think, up, right up until quite recent times. And so it's important to note that the, the sort of feminist standpoint the, and, the, and the theoretical view that infuses the work, these works are, are quite varied. 
And I don't do a, a critique of that in any, or make that explicit particularly. I basically take the women's words kind of at face value and, and try and show what it is that they think that they were doing. I think the earliest work I might have had was Phyllida Salmon's work, actually, which is 1992. I think that's the earliest work I had. And so what I found that is, is that when I looked at the work and drew back and thought about it was that there were kind of four major issues that came up. And as I said earlier, if you're familiar with the work on feminist pedagogy in universities, which is, which is an older body of work than this work by maybe a couple of decades, these themes are very, very familiar to us. The themes of paying attention to power, emphasizing relationality, asserting the importance of care, and perhaps more recently, but, but, but in different guises, I think this theme has also been going on for a long time, for grounding the, the workings of desire, embodiment, and emotion or affect. And so I've given some examples to illustrate kind of what I was finding in the works that led me to these kinds of conclusions. And so there's a, a quote from Jarvis and Zukas about power, the argument that power. So some people argue that power is very, uh, have a very zero sum game uh, uh, analysis of power. The supervisor has it all. Uh, this, the institution or the traditional model of supervision means the supervisor has it all, the student has none. And as a feminist supervisor, I'm going to do my best to flatten that power relationship, to give power to the student and so on. And others have a slightly more complex view, which I think Jarvis and Zukas probably has, which is they sort of recognize that it's kind of an impossible task to kind of give over or to obliterate the power relation of supervision, that you have to somehow find a way to, to navigate it, to regard it, as it were. So different views on what the issue is, but a strong sense that power is a problem that has to be thought about, addressed, and re regarded. <clears throat> Relationality, also very important. And there's a quote from Phyllida Salmon. She's got a very um, distinctive view of supervision as, as intensely personal um, as, a, as, a, as a relationship that really rests for its for its kind of power and its effectivity on this personal resonance on the part. She talks about a personal resonance on the part of the supervisor to the student's sense of meaning and excitement. I kind of love her quote because it holds together the student, the person of the student and the student's engagement with the work as one bundle of things that the supervisor seeks to find um, a strong resonance with. Whereas for others, and in my own work, sometimes I've separated out the project and the student, but Phyllis de Salmon um, holds them together. Emphasizing the importance of care. Care is probably the most difficult thing in the literature. There is um, a strong sense among some that, um, I, 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 actually I might come back to this, I might just lay this out for an hour and come back to the care because it is one of the, one of the thorny issues that um, uh, turns up in the literature. And then there are a couple of quotes there that pick up the issue of bodies. Again, quite different. And the last quote is quite a fascinating piece of writing by Margaret Somerville and her student Sarah Crinnell. Um, which is a very, which is almost like a series of letters, love letters in a way, written between a supervisor and a student. It's, it's surprisingly engaging and sometimes discombobulating reading um, that that piece of writing because of the intimacy um, that's inside it. With respect to the second question, what are women? Uh, what uh, is the woman supervisor really just a man? Which is my much more kind of complicated and difficult question, and. I, it's a kind of an edgy question, I think. And my answer to that in the end is something like kind of in a way, which is not an answer that I think many feminist supervisors would want to have. But and so let me explain what it is that I mean about that. And what I and what and what I and what kind of data that I get from that, that I drew to get that view, really, I suppose. I get from quite a lot of the writing, there is a kind of sense of unease, unsettlement, uncertainty, feeling out of place, discomfort with being authoritative, which seems to me to indicate that despite desires to be, um, uh, to, to do supervision differently, that was definitely there in the literature and lots of illustrations of efforts to make that the case. And, and I don't want to discount that. So it's, we're holding these things together at the same time. Um, there is, I think, a sense in which the women 
are they are caught up in something that predates them, that is much bigger than them, that that hails them in certain kinds of ways. So Bartlett and Mercer uh, have a nice quote that in the way illustrates that. She says, all the circulating meanings and representations, they say, all the circulating meanings and representations that women bear inevitably disrupt the narrative of authority, genius, charismatic master. And so in the middle of those narratives, how do we make satisfactory positions for ourselves? So really what they're capturing is the fact that women arrive, and we're quite recent arrivals in this scene, into something that is already there. And the fact that we have to try and find a place for ourselves which is not because we cannot easily occupy um, the pre-existing places, if you like, um, leaves us with a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty. And their book chapter, um, Bartlett and Mercer's book chapter, kind of gives the answer to how it is that they think this is possible. I mean, it's interesting to read those answers 20 years later and to consider how gripping or those answers are. It's something that you could do yourself if you're interested. So I say here, on the one hand, simply being a woman is an interruption to the business as usual of the university. But on the other hand, we arrive into this system that's so, that is very old, that is very, um, people have described it as a sleeping elephant that's extremely difficult to change. And maybe at a, a deep and fundamental level that we it's very hard for us to stand. It may be that if, if it, to keep it as it is, it cannot be changed. I, I don't know the answer to this, to be honest. But I certainly know that the women write about the struggles here. So um, we get um, Leonard describing how the structure of academic life position supervises as quasi-parents. And again, that's that old sort of template of the academic as the in loco parentis and then the Dr. Vada supervisor, um, a kind of place that we're caught up in, which kind of doesn't give us a lot of options about being different maybe, although there are some writers, Jane Gallup being one of them, who try to argue for a different, much kind of sexier place to be in as an academic, but that argument also kind of runs into some fairly um, powerful walls, I think. Leonard's quote at the end, feminists tread on men's turf when entering the university. We do it with a lot of self-recrimination and self-blame. We get exhausted by the process. We carry weights on our feet. And what I saw uh, in the literature as I reviewed it was quite a lot of stories of women struggling with authority, struggling with the burden of too much care, struggling with exhaustion. And I know, for instance, I'm, I can see you nodding, Sandy, this is the issue of women and academic work and what it demands of them in the way it is currently configured. And really that has not changed. If anything, it has intensified in the last 30 years. Um, is a very difficult place for women to be. So in one sense, my answer, is the woman supervisor really just a man? In a way, that, that's where I get my sort of nuance. In a, sort of a, in a kind of way, yes, because that's what the system requires. And as a consequence of that, what I see in the literature, and, and this is given, even given the fact that there are um, a lot of very good stories in the literature about what it is to be a, a feminist supervisor and about the efforts that women are making. I see a scene that is actually quite conflicted and has quite a lot of risks and dangers um, for academic women and potentially gets for the students um, they supervise. So here are some of the examples from the literature that I reviewed that, that acknowledge this. And so Jarvis and, Zuc and Zucas, wonder what worry about the denial of the significance of knowledge and power in research relationships and an overemphasis on reciprocity and mutuality so they they're worrying about how we're feminist thinking around care and relationality and the desire to 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 refuse traditional power relations might lead women and again um johnson lee and green johnson lee and green point out the sort of similar kind of um uh uh, risks of being overwhelmed. Uh, Lauren Berlant has written about this as well with respect to feminist pedagogues in the university, feminist teachers, feminist academics. Jane Gallup, coming at from a very different kind of angle and trying to sort of argue a very different line also, sort of she says that the supervisor is inevitably, inevitably too close to invested and cares too much. So there's something kind of, there's a problem at the foundation of what it is to be a supervisor. 
And then there's a couple of other quotes here on the other side, which kind of, I'm trying to get a sense, give you a sense of the different angles that women, the women who are writing uh, come at this um, question and this issue of risk and danger from. So Leonard sees the dangers for women in terms of their own work, their own careers, getting burned out, not being able to get there, to get, have, to take care of their own careers as academic. And Thread Gold um, cites Jane Flax's work to look at one of the dangers that can be for students who find themselves suddenly having having attached themselves to sort of a powerful caring mother find themselves suddenly thrown out into the cold by that powerful caring mother and then and then what might happen to the supervision relationship um, as a consequence of that and here are my sort of so here are my kind of concluding thoughts really having had a look at the literature and I'm sure I haven't given you anything like enough data um, from the text that I looked at to to get here straightforwardly, um, there's a lot more, the, there is a lot more detail obviously in the paper. But so so my my final thoughts are kind of a mixture of things. On the one hand, I do think, and it's clear to me that women, and I mean I think about my own experience as well, of course, but it's clear to me from the research literature that women are reflexively, self consciously. Um, resisting the traditional architecture of supervision and the research tells us this in different ways again and again and again and I think probably they are um, transforming the norms of supervision um, this is of course an empirical question but even if I think back to my own experience of being in a university for the last few decades and when I see how the institution treats supervision how the institution writes about supervision in its sort of policy documents and in its kind of practices there's been an, an enormous shift towards towards a much more if you like caring and careful uh, model of supervision than there was when I started as a super as a student um uh, in the uh, back in the in the late 19th in the late 20th century so I think in a way what I'm we might be seeing is the fact as the way that women have thought and argued and talked about supervision is having some kind of change on how the system is working Certainly it's become a lot more, the normal expectation is a lot more hands-on. It's a lot more relational than it used to be. But there are considerable tensions for practicing supervision in a more personal way, in a globalized massified system. So this is the other thing, of course, that's happened in the last 30 years is that the number of doctoral students has bloomed. And so we're now dealing with, um, some people don't want to use the word massified to describe doctoral education, but others will. We're certainly dealing with a, with a huge increase in the number of, of students requiring supervision. And so institutional expectations and are intensifying at the same time as staff student ratios have really shifted in, uh, in an unfavorable way for academic work, for academic staff. Um, the new managerialism and corporatization is the dominant logic. And I mean, Di Leonard would say that this is a gendered project. It's a kind of new, she describes it as a new form of masculinity, of academic masculinity. Um, uh, and so that's just something we can think about. Is this how, what neoliberalism looks like? It's Some people would describe it as a soft form of the traditional liberalism because of its sort of social project aspects. But um, Others have a different view because of its competitive individualism. Um, gender relations are pluralistic and contested, contested uh, it's even more complexly than they were. And I, I think I think the question I would like to, let, to get to and then to leave us to have some conversation about and along with other things that you might want to talk about is do we need to rethink the feminist person, personalizing of supervision? Is it, is it actually um, too um, risky? too demanding, too likely to lead to um, burnout among, um, among uh, academic women. And I think this is actually a real risk. And I was interested to see in the work of Candice Chu, and I think, Jamie, I got Candice Chu from you, actually, for one of the, from the paper that you wrote. And in that paper, which where she talks about mentoring, advising, she's a North American academic, she actually argues for a return to the impersonality of the advisor. So I don't super, I don't advise or supervise you in this kind of way because I'm a feminist woman who has these convictions and want to have a, a wonderful relationship with you as a student. I do this in an impersonal way because it's my obligation as an academic 
it's a kind of a withdrawal of the sort of more personal aspects of the of the contract, which feminism, I think, has led us down the road towards into a more kind of impersonal space. And um, and I'm kind of curious to think about what that would look like if we were to do that, if we were to return to a space which is more impersonal, maybe a return back to some kind of um, uh, emphasizing the intellectual encounter, even if it's now more of an embodied intellectual encounter. Um, but what would it look like if we were to go to some other place? Okay, that's kind of, I think, where I'm going to get to. I'm going to stop now. So what I'd like to do is stop sharing so I, we can see each other and just have conversation.